passage, but Psalm 27, okay? If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 27. I am so stoked that when Pastor Samuel and I were talking about Psalms and um, there was a few that I wanted to do. And at first this one seemed off limit because he thought he was gonna cover it. So I was reading through and praying through some other ones. Uh, I couldn't remember if he said this one. So I text him and I was like, hey, I'm thinking of this or this. And he came back with a glorious text that says, hey man, run with it, do Psalm 27. I was like, thank you, Lord, you answered my prayer. Uh, Psalm 27, 14 verses. This has, has spoken so much to me especially uh, in the last 10 years since we've been down there. I, I don't know of another psalm or maybe passage of scripture that, that so many verses have, have played such a vital part uh, in my life personally, in our family, and, and really in our ministry, what we're doing down there. Uh, it's a short psalm, 14 verses, uh, written by David. It's an interesting psalm because it's kind of all over the place. David, uh, as often was the case, was constantly on the run, constantly fleeing, constantly running for his life, hiding out in caves and caverns and behind bushes and, and whatnot. And so a lot of that comes out in his writing, right, and throughout the psalms. Well, in this one in particular, it starts kind of intense and then it starts with just this hunger and this passion and this desire that David has and then it ends uh, in verses 13 and 14. So I'm really excited to share with you guys some of the things that the Lord uh, has spoken um, to me. As I was rereading this on the plane um, flying to Florida as I was rereading it, these 14 verses, this time around, there was this overall theme that really stood out to me. This overall kind of the anthem theme, maybe title of the message or whatnot. And, and here is what I see and what I get from this. Absolute, utter dependence on God. See, we got some amens already. That's a good thing. Why are we saying amen? Because we need that. And why did I put absolute and utter in, utter in there? Because we need something more than just dependence on God, right? Uh, we, it would be easy to say, oh, I depend on God. Oh God, we depend on you in this, but absolute utter dependency. We're gonna see as we read through some of these verses, David had nothing else but to absolutely and utterly depend on his God. And when we're brought to a place of absolute utter dependence, it starts transforming and changing us. And that's why when you read stuff that we're gonna see here, when, when, when difficulties and challenges and, and we go through things like a pandemic and, and things drastically change and we're just in, in this, this maybe wilderness time that we... That, we feel that we're in, that is when God wants to speak to us in a most profound way. And so right off the bat, in the first three, three verses, look at what it says. Psalm 27, verse one, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold or my strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid when evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes? It is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war rise against me. Yet, what does he say? I will be confident. And check this out. His confidence is not I know I'm going to die, right? Evildoers are assailing him. People are wanting to eat up his flesh. Adversaries, foes, an army encamped against him. War rises against him. I am pretty confident I'm going to die. That's not what he's saying here. David, after reading this, after reading what you're saying, how in the world are you confident? Well, we see that very clearly in verse one. David says three things. God is my light, God is my salvation, and God is my strength. What do I have to fear? Listen, it wasn't that David all of a sudden things, again, I'm not sure where he was at when this was taking place. It's not like all of a sudden things became okay, and all that scary stuff went away. No, he just grew more confidently 
in who his God was. I love when scriptures become personal like this. I like when people who are writing the scriptures say things like, my God, right? Because that, that, that means we can do the same. You understand that? Is God your light? Is he your salvation? Is he your stronghold or your strength? Are you confident in him? When all things like difficulties and challenges and whatnot are taking place, is your com- what is your confidence lying? David is like, you know what? In light of, and despite all this craziness, this craziness and everything that's taking place, I don't have anything to fear because I have my light and my savior and my strength and my stronghold. And I love how as, as David continues to write this, it wasn't just this confidence. He's not just saying, I'm, um, I'm going to be confident in this. It was a desire and passion of his. Look what it says in verse four. One thing I have asked, other versions say, one thing I have desired of the Lord. It says one thing, okay? One thing I have asked. One thing I have desired. David is not making this list of all this things that he would like, things of of all this. It's just, I got one thing. It's one thing that I desire. And not only is it a desire or an ask, but it is that very thing that he is what? That I will seek after. There's a huge difference between desiring something and seeking something. How many of you desire to be used by God? Raise your hand. If you desire to be used, you know, God, I desire to be used. How many of you are actively seeking to be used by God, right? How many of you desire to have a good marriage? How many of you are actively seeking to have a good marriage? How many of you brothers are really trying to actively seek to have a good marriage? <laughs> There's a big jump between desire and seek. We can say, I desire all this. Oh, I desire this and desire this. And we, oh, and we can just live in this bubble of desire. But David is saying, it's the one thing I desire. It's the one thing that, that I ask for. And now I'm getting after it. I am seeking it. And check out what his desire is. It's not, I want to be a big conqueror. I want to get out of this cave and go back to being king and then all this stuff. I want to eat a great meal. No, it's I want to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And I want to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. And then I want to inquire in his temple. Isn't that amazing? Go from desire to seek, from seek to to dwelling, from dwelling to gazing, from gazing to inquiring. Absolute, utter dependence on God. David is this, I want to hang out with God all the time. I want to be in the tabernacle just chilling. How many of you have felt that before where you have just wanted to hang out and be at church all the time? Or maybe when a service is coming to an end, you're doing a worship night or something and it's kind of time for the last song, but you don't want it to end, right? There's something so sweet and so powerful when we gather together, when we have worship nights, when we have times like this, when we have community groups, when we have home fellowships, when we have discipleship groups, when we have Bible studies, men's Bible studies, women, all this stuff. But you know what? One of the biggest shocks for my wife and I when we went on the mission field was not having any of that. I don't think we fully thought through what it was gonna be like leaving, having pastor to church and youth group and doing event after event and Bible study after Bible study and all these things which are all so wonderful and it's all so good and then being thrust into a small little town five hours south of El Paso, 2,500 people. You don't speak the language. You're a mile high up. You are going to a church which is a wonderful church but again, you don't understand the language and you go from having all that to like nothing. It was, it's like jumping in that little pond lake that's by my hotel that I stayed at. It would be freezing jumping in to a cold lake. And this shook us to the core. We were lonely. It was hard. There was times in that first year, it was like, uh, maybe we should go back. 
But it was in that place that really we had a few options. Either we go back and you go back and you work at a church and then you start experiencing all that stuff again. You do nothing, you spiritually starve or you start seeking God in an absolute, utter, dependent way. And we started doing that in our own personal devotion times and praying with each other and, um, and seeking the Lord and prayer walks. And I got to tell you, even in that time of loneliness and feeling isolated, I met God in a way I never had before. I think that's what David's talking about here. Because he's not saying this from the, the, the beautiful view of his castle or whatever. He's saying this from the depths of the craziness in the surroundings. It's his passion. It's his desire. It's what he's seeking after. He, he wants to be with the Lord. He says in verse five, God will hide me in his shelter. Again, I love just David reminding himself and reminding us today of what our God will do. He will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. What is he saying for here in verse five? He's saying, my God has me. He is taking care of me. And whether you're here in Beaverton, Oregon, and uh, you're tending a church and things are great, God is there taking care of you. Or whether you're in Mexico serving in a town, God is there taking care of you. God is wanting to minister, reveal himself to us, and to know, hey, you don't have to worry. worry. I am here. I am your light. I am your salvation. I am your stronghold. You just be confident in who I am, and I take care of the rest. It's so freeing, isn't it? And yet it's so hard because we live in this, in this world and we're sinful and we're carnal. And it is so much easier to say, amen, mm-hmm. Who knows what's gonna happen when we go out that door and we get in our car and we go to wherever we're going. But we gotta carry these principles with us. We gotta carry this thought with us and this desire to dwell in the house of the Lord, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to, to inquire in the Lord's temple. He continues in verse six, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around and I will offer in this tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I love this. The end of verse six, if there was a time when you didn't think like worshiping and praising God would be a great opportunity to do this when you're about to get eaten up by whatever that means in evildoers and armies. He's saying in light of all this, my head shall be lifted up and I'm gonna offer sacrifices with shouts of joy and I'm gonna sing and I'm gonna make melody to my God. Saints, our worship times can be so powerful in the midst of great difficulty and tragedy. And we see that with Job as everything is stripped away the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh, but blessed be the name of the Lord. And so when we're down in Mexico and, and you miss times like this, oh man, wasn't worship awesome this morning? That was, wow, it's just beautiful. I wanted to keep singing. But whether we're doing something like this with a full band or you're in your car sitting outside of the office waiting for that important meeting, you can have just as much of a powerful worship time. I've had some of the most spontaneous worship times. I think people, th I love walking. People probably think I'm crazy. Even when I was walking the lake yesterday, I was worshiping and singing and praying and talking through my sermon out loud. And I got a few looks like this and I, you know, well, hopefully they heard something, maybe it encouraged them or something. A life of worship, a life of singing and making melody to the Lord, no matter what. David continues, and, and now just in a prayer. Hear, O Lord, now hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. God, I want to hear from you. He says in verse eight, you have said, seek my face. My heart says to your face, Lord, do I seek. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is calling out to us to seek him every single day, every single moment. 
he's saying that. Seek me. Come to me, right? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden in the, in the, in the gospel of Matthew. My, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Uh, I will give you rest. Seek me, seek me. And look at David. He's saying, hey, Lord, you said to do it, so I'm going to do it. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. And then verse nine is interesting. Hide not your face from me, nor turn your servant away in anger, or you who have been my help. Cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. God, if you're telling me to seek you, I'm gonna seek you. But if I'm seeking you, you gotta respond. I gotta hear from you. How many of you have desired that before. God, I need to hear from you. And how many of you, you've needed to hear in a moment and it hasn't come in the way that you wanted it to come. God, I am waiting. (laughs) I am seeking. I am doing what Jeremiah 29, 13 says. It says, and you will seek me and find me when what? When you search for me with all your heart. I often have to ask myself, Lord, am I not hearing from you because you're just not speaking to me or maybe because I'm not seeking you with all my heart? Am I not hearing from you, Lord, because I'm just throwing up a quick prayer because I got to go about my day and do the rest of the stuff? Or because I'm just reading a quick verse and I don't, have, I'm, I'm, I don't have time. I got a busy schedule. I'm not sitting down. I don't know what the exact answer is, but what I do know is this. You will find God when you search for him with all your heart. And that's what David's doing here. God, you told me to do it. I'm doing it. I am seeking after you. I am searching for with all my heart. Respond to me, Lord. Don't ignore me. Don't cast me off. Don't forsake me, O God of my salvation. And then he says something interesting in verse 10. For my mother and my father have forsaken forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Or other versions, the Lord will take care of me. Uh, Years ago when we started, when we, the goal of us going down there was to start an orphanage. It was what the Lord had called us uh, to do. And uh, we, we bought that property. We started building that main campus. And over the years, we cared, cared for over 60, 60 to 65 kids, some true orphans, um, some who had, you know, a parent, but just um, maybe abandoned by one parent, um, a single mom or grandparent just needs assistance helping with their kid. Um, and that's what we did for, for the um, six years and God blessed it and did just incredible things in it. And this was the theme verse for our ministry on our website, on business cards, on all of that stuff for uh, my mother, my father and my mother have forsaken me. The Lord will take me in. How many of you, you don't have to raise your, how many of you have felt forsaken before? You know, maybe some of you are here this morning and you, right now you're feeling forsaken. How many of you have been let down by somebody? Burnt by another pastor, another church, a spouse? Listen, there's times when we live in a world where it just feels like a bunch of letdowns, right? That's why people say, man, can't I just catch a break? <laughs> yeah, you can when you're following the Lord because he never lets you down, no matter what. And so when your world feels like it's caving in and collapsing and you feel isolated and you feel alone and all this, that is the spot where we can realize, holy cow, everything has forsaken me except for my God. Isaiah 49, 15 and 16 uh, we had a mission team down from Florida and um, actually the, the gal that helped do all the drawings for the VBS we did, I had her write this verse uh, in Spanish um, in my office. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Mm. 
I will not forget you because I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. I was mindful of every single one of you when I went to the cross to die for you. Incredible. And again, I think, this might sound a little weird, but I'll just say it. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe God needs to shake things up a little bit in our lives. Because we can get so comfortable and so complacent and we can, the temptation is to kind of lose sight maybe a little bit of some of these things. And I don't wish hardship on anybody because hardship is, stinks, <laughs> it's horrible. But I think when we come through the end and we see the fruit of it, we're able to say to another person, hey, I know that you're going through this, but man, God can meet you there. David understood when all else forsakes me, the Lord will take care of me. Verse 11, teach me. Now he's asking, Lord, teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries for false witnesses have risen against me and they breathe out violence. David's hunger and his desire is, Lord, teach me and show me and lead me. How many of you, you want that in your life? You want God to lead you. I do. I am not smart enough to try to figure stuff out on my own. I had no skills to start an orphanage. I did not have any skills to run a nonprofit. I didn't go to school to get any type of degrees to help with any of these types of things. And so graciously and thankfully, God in his mercy has just allowed me to be a part of what he is doing. But I am always praying, God, teach me, lead me, show me. I want to stay in a place of being teachable and leadable, if that's a word. We couldn't figure out if that was a word for service or not. Totally, yeah, he just said it. Okay, leadable. Leadable and teachable, moldable, all these things. I want to stay in that place so that God can always work and move and construct and tear down and build up and do all these things that he wants to do in my life to make me a better person, to make me more like him in my pursuit of him. Teach me, O Lord, and lead me. And then finally, we get down to verse 13 and 14. Now, these verses have played, have just been profound, um, especially as just being down in Mexico, our, our just desire of, Lord, what's going to happen? <laughs> like, what's your plan for our lives? Um, how... When, when the pandemic happened and, and everything shut down and then after one year and then after two years and all this stuff, God just made it clear that um, the orphanage was not to open the way that it was before. Um, can you put the picture back up of our building, just our property? So I've spent hours and hours and days and days walking our property. This area over here, we've got this track and just walking, my wife and I, we just walk and walk and pray and talk and just seeking the Lord of saying, Lord, it doesn't make sense what's going on. How, how can a pandemic shut everything down and that all this goes to waste? Surely there's something else that you have. And um, we entered a time of beginning to lose heart. And look at what David says in verse 13. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Other, another version says, I would have lost heart unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. NASB version says, I certainly believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the, wind, of the living. All of this was not because it was revealed to David what God was going to do. This was out of fervent belief that God was going to do something. 
I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord. I would have lost heart unless I believed. I certainly believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. When there was a time to quit, call it, call it quits, give up. He's saying no. Why? Because I am believing that God is going to do something. I'm believing I'm going to see his goodness. I'm believing that he's going to show something. And therefore, in that I am able to, in verse 14, wait on the Lord. Something we all love doing, right? Waiting. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. How many of you during the pandemic felt like, how much longer do I got to (laughs) wait? Yeah, Lord. I mean, can we just move this on? We speed things up a little quicker? No. And so in our desire, my wife and I believing, well, God has not called us home. Okay, God, what is it? We're gonna wait on you. We're gonna trust you. We, we want you to be our strength. We, our hearts wanna take courage. And it did take courage in what the Lord was doing. But Lord, what do you have? Because God had given me a verse in Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? That part in the middle, behold, I am doing a new thing. When God started revealing to us this verse, um, that new thing came in the form of starting a Christian school on our campus. It was a desire that we had had before the pandemic when the, we wanted to do a school on our campus for the kids in the orphanage because a lot of them were really far behind. And so it wasn't like this foreign concept, but um, when the Lord closed, officially closed the door um, last year and said, that chapter is done, behold, I'm going to do something new. Okay, God. And this is so significant in, in this in Isaiah 43, 18, who does it say is going to do this new thing? Amen. We should have that underlined and highlighted. I am doing a new thing. <laughs> it's not Jason, Jackie, great job, six years, you do orphanage, I need you guys to do something new for me. No, it's God saying, hey guys, I'm going to do a new thing. Uh, would you like to be a part of that? God invites us in to be a part, uh, right? Does God need us to go out and save everybody? No. Does he want to use us? Yes. Are you amazed that he wants to use us? Yes. So it's all about him. And so I really felt like, okay, Lord, if if you're wanting to do this, um, I don't know what this looks like, going back to the not knowing what to do. I mean, I've, I've not been... I've never been a teacher. I didn't do super good in school. Uh, I was on the airplane and the lady next to me, we were chatting and she said, what do you do? And I said, oh, I direct a nonprofit and started talking. She said, what does it do? I said, well, we have a school in Mexico. And she said, oh, so you're an educator? I was like, <laughs> uh, no, like, she's like, like, you got your degree in this? I was like, no. <laughs> Slowly put my AirPods back in <laughs> to try to... No, I'm not. But I'm a servant of the most high God who wants to do a new thing. And somehow he wants to use me in that. And he wants to use all of you. So we thought the school would be maybe 12 to 15 kids as we began, we shared it with our church and um, down in Mexico. And uh, they got really excited, excited. Our board got excited. And we just thought, you know what? Um, the Lord... I think the Lord is in us. I think this is the new thing that he's doing. So we had, we invited the church to come to a kind of an open house info meeting. I got a picture from that evening. Uh, there, there's way more people than we anticipated. There was over 60 people that came. The majority of those were from our community. So I don't know how word got out. I don't know how they knew that they were having, we were having this meeting. We purposely did not put it on social media or anything else because we weren't sure how logistically it would work out. Well, nevertheless, God had something different plan. He brought all these people out here. And so we're sharing just our heart and our desire, kind of our vision. This was back in April. 
Again, not knowing a lot of the details, we had two teachers that had committed. We had the facility, uh, obviously the orphanage. We figured we could, you know, 15 to 18 would be a good start. Uh, and then the second half of the meeting, uh, Pastor Luis, who is my uncle and pastors the church down there, he began to share the heart. Obviously, it's a private Christian school with an English immersion program, so the students learn uh, take English classes 45 minutes a day. We have Bible class. We have devotions in the morning because this is a Christian school. We want to see these kids' lives changed. So he's sharing this to all these people. And I thought, well, surely the numbers are going to drop back down because people are going to be like, why would I pay $50 a month to send my school, my kids to this? And you know how you go through all those thoughts and then the enemy starts coming in? Well, the Lord had something else planned. By the time registration week was over, we had 54 students registered, kindergarten to uh, junior high. Still only had two teachers, still didn't have the building ready. And this was like, got signed up, paid, and we're like, we need to probably figure out what to do. So we started praying, Lord, <laughs> this is your new thing. You got to work it out. You got to bring teachers. You got to do this. And you know what? The Lord did it. We hadn't had mission teams for over two and a half years. And then in the span of, of, of two and a half months, three teams came down. One of those teams was from this church. It was perfect timing. And the Lexi and Mikey and this, the, this team just banging down wall. We were trying to remodel as, as quickly as we can. And then we had a team from Missouri. They were with us. Um, classes started on September 5th. And we were working um, Sunday night until about 11 o'clock to finish the final things before first day of classes. Got some pictures of the school here as we close up. Um, so this is during devotions in the morning, the kids from 8 to 8.15, and then they go about their day. Uh, I mentioned English classes. The next uh, picture is in the English room. Um, my aunt, Kim, who, Pastor Luis's wife, um, she is the English teacher. Uh, the kids love speaking English. Um, my wife, Jackie, stepped up. And she is the kindergarten teacher. I am so amazed by my wife. My wife was crazy enough to follow me down to Mexico. And then the Lord moved on our heart. We cared for kids and she's done so much. If you guys have met my wife, you're like, man, she's awesome. She is amazing. And now she's our kindergarten teacher. So she's got 12 kiddos, 12 kindergartners. This was that room where she was at was one of the dorm rooms, which we converted to classroom. This is our junior high room. Um, I teach music class. I got roped into doing that. And so for Christmas, uh, these are the kids. They did a music presentation on music throughout the world. And, um, and then we've got pictures of, uh, these are the school pictures. Um, so this is the kindergarten class. And then this is first through third with um, the maestra Marlene. And then our fourth and fifth graders with, with the Profe Cruz, our, my uncle and our pastor. We have sixth graders with Esmeralda. And then our seventh, eighth, and ninth graders um, in our junior high. And it's just been incredible. I got the next picture to show. This is our staff and our team that God supernaturally and, and brought together in his timing. A wonderful, yeah, thank you for that. A wonderful group of men and women wanting to serve the Lord and the students. Uh, I got two more pictures and we'll close up. This was from our Christmas program. Uh, our desire has just been, man, if we're going to do a school, let's do it right. If we're going to do music class, let's, let's teach these kids. So I was, I was tasked with, given the task to teach 35 kids to play an instrument for our Christmas program. Uh, I... Uh, fourth and fifth graders, man, we went all out. They learned the recorder. They loved it. Everybody else did not because they're playing silent night. But you know what? And then our, our junior high sixth graders, they, they sing a song or, or junior hires learn, go tell it on the mountain, uh, instruments, and they're playing these songs. So we have this Christmas program. This is a picture from it. We couldn't fit anymore. Over 100 people came. 
family, friends, people who had never set foot into something like this, probably because there hadn't been something like this. And then the next night we had it for our junior high, our upper students, and there was over 80 that came. And so God's saying, I'm gonna do a new thing, man. You, you, you ministered to these kids in the orphanage and that was great because you got to share me and you got to share the gospel with them. But now I wanna, I wanna broaden things where you're gonna keep sharing the gospel with kids, but now you're gonna get to share it with their families and their friends and the impact that we're having now as a Christian school in this community that has never had that before. It is unbelievable. We just had uh, pre-inscriptions uh, enrollment for the upcoming year. And we have 30 student, new students signed up. So we're anticipating 80 to, I don't know, 100 or whatever for next year. That seems a little overwhelming because we need more teachers. We need more buildings. We need to do these things. And that's why we have, you know, churches like you guys and people that come down. People have said, hey, how can we support you guys? Number one, you can pray for us. Number two, um, you can partner with us. We have a program where you can help sponsor a child's tuition. Uh, tuition per student is $150 a month. That helps provide their supplies and their books, transportation, um, um, food and all that. And we only charge $50 because that's what people can afford. So we try to raise the other $100 per child. So if you guys are interested in maybe um, partnering with us in that way, all that info is out there. And then finally, just, man, this is one of my favorite stories. Last picture. I had to take a picture with this little gal. This, she pops into the office at the end of school Going, I don't know a lot of history behind the story with her family. Um, but she has been coming to the school. She loves our school. She is either in first or second grade. And um, over the years, I've always worn bracelets. Anytime kids have made bracelets and stuff in the orphanage, um, I've, I've worn those. And so I've got this pink one. People will be like, why are you wearing a pink bracelet? Uh, that says Jesus loves you. Well, I wear it because of this little girl. Uh, their teacher tasked them with the, op with the goal to take a bracelet, find somebody, give it to them, tell them Jesus loves you, and then recite their memory verse. And she came to my office and just with that beautiful look, face, she gave me this bracelet, put it on, and she started re reciting her memory verse and tell me that Jesus loves me. And here's a little girl that I've never met before, but now she's in a place where she is learning how much Jesus loves her. And uh, every once in a while at school when I see her, she's always checking if I got my bracelet on. And she says, you still have it? I said, I'm not taking this thing off. Brothers and sisters, we have a God that loves us and he died for us and he saved us, and he's our light, and he's our salvation, and he's our strength. And he wants us to dwell with him, to behold his beauty, to inquire upon him, to seek after him with all of our hearts so that he can reveal more of himself in our lives. When we do that, and then he responds, our lives are changed, amen? And it doesn't have to just be because you're down in Mexico and doing a school. It can be right here and right now. Will you join me as we pray, as the worship team comes up and as we close? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God, for your love for us. And we thank you, Lord, that you don't give up on us. We thank you, Lord, that you never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you, Lord, that we can, our hope and our assurance is found in you. And God, I don't know what is taking place in the lives of these dear ones here. I imagine there's some uh, 
difficulties and challenges going on. But Lord, as we close and as we worship, may we be reminded that we serve a living God. We serve a God whose mercies are new every morning, who is with us at every moment. And we serve a God that wants to use us. You want to work in us to then work through us. We pray that you would use this time to reveal more of yourself to us.